Well, welcome to the Friary at Mission House at uh, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin near Times Square, New York. I'm Brother Damien, and this is Brother Thomas. Um, we're recording this uh, reflection as a continuation of a Lenten series that we began uh, a few weeks ago at uh, the Church of St. Luke in Seacliff, New York. Uh, we were to be with them again earlier this week, uh, but obviously in the midst of uh, our restrictions uh, related to the COVID pandemic, we weren't able to travel to be with them, and their rector, uh, Father Jesse, asked if we would consider uh, providing uh, the uh, continuation of our of our series by video. And so that's what we're doing today. Um, we uh, are glad to be back with those of you at Seacliff who are watching. And uh, we hope that uh, perhaps others who are outside of and uh, beyond the Seacliff, uh, the St. Luke Seacliff community uh, may join this as well. If you are joining uh, us here uh, without having been at the first uh, session of the series, don't worry. Uh, this will stand on its own uh, and you should be able to uh, to follow along without any difficulty. During the course of our time here, uh, we're going to ask you to turn off the video several times to take some silence and pause um, and uh, we'll give you some opportunities and some suggestions for some exercises that you may do uh, to help broaden the experience uh, of your Lent uh, and um, we'll also provide you through links in the comments uh, with uh, a few documents that will be helpful for you including the reading that we're using and a description of the method. We were asked to uh, do a Lenten series uh, and chose the theme of uh, several contemplative methods uh, that, um, that might be an assistance to people's experience of Lent and, and in the longer term to uh, their ability to uh, interact with the scriptures in a contemplative way and uh, with the ultimate goal, of course, of, of simply giving people tools uh, for, to improve their relationship with God. We began uh, last week with a, uh, a dis or not last week, but two weeks ago rather, uh, with a discussion of a method called Lexio Divina, uh, which is a method of contemplative Bible reading. Uh, and this week we will be looking at a, another uh, Ignatian method of contemplative Bible reading uh, that we're referring to simply as the, the Ignatian active imagination, active imagination method and we hope that you'll find these useful. These are obviously really strange times for all of us, uh, and um, there are a lot of challenges that we're facing, not least of all uh, the challenge that most of us are on our own in this and, and unable to gather with those who we would normally turn to for support. Uh, we are unable to be literally with the folks at uh, St. Luke's and or with any of you who might be watching now. Uh, and yet, one of the uh, things that this uh, time might actually be uh, able to be used as a benefit for, or one of the things that we might harvest out of a difficult time, uh, is the time of silence, the time of slowing down, the ability to be uh, alone, which when imposed is, is uh, not pleasant, but which when we choose it is part of uh, the a contemplative spirituality and a spirituality that can bring us great peace. And so we hope that these will be useful tools for you. So let's dive in. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, have a look at a particular scripture. Uh, it is uh, from John, uh, from the Gospel according to John. It is uh, the lectionary reading for this coming Sunday uh, in the Revised Common Lectionary. Uh, it will be familiar to many of you. It is the story of the raising of Lazarus. When we do contemplative Bible reading, uh, we approach the Bible and we approach the scripture that we're reading in a different way than if we were doing an academic Bible study. Uh, we uh, Academic Bible studies with um, 
outlines and word by word analysis and, and reference to the original Greek and to commentators and all of those kind of things is a very valuable tool, but it's not what we're doing here. Uh, the practice of contemplative Bible reading is rather intended not to extract doctrine from the text, but rather to interact with the text in a way that allows us to experience the Bible, that allows us to experience um, what's going on within us and what it raises within us, and thereby uh, ideally to experience the presence of God and our relationship with Christ in a way that we might not otherwise have done. This particular practice that we're going to talk about today, uh, the active imagination method, uh, it comes, or at least is most familiarized, uh, or brought to us in a most familiar way, uh, by the Ignatian tradition. The Ignatian tradition um, is uh, the tradition of the Society of Jesus, or uh, the Jesuits uh, the, are the, uh, the Ignatians, so-called because of their founder, Ignatius of Loyola, who developed most of these methods. Uh, Ignatius was, uh, lived, was a priest who lived in the uh, late 1400s into the mid-1500s. He was a soldier and uh, was uh, thought to be headed for great fame as a, as a war hero uh, when he sustained a serious injury. Uh, a cannonball shattered his leg. It put him into seclusion and recovery for a very long period of time, and during that time he had uh, extended silence enforced on him. He had extended alone time enforced on him. And he spent that time reading uh, about Christ and reading of the lives of the saints, and he experienced a significant conversion. He then began in his mind to develop uh, a, a series of methods, no doubt influenced by his military training, uh, that would be an organized and methodical and specific way uh, of approaching spiritual growth. And uh, among them, uh, are the practice of Lexio Divina, this act of imagination practice that we are going to talk about today. Uh, largely, uh, Ignatius is credited with uh, developing the, uh, what we might call, or most of what we would call the uh, field of spiritual direction today, uh, many of the tools that are used in that field, as well as uh, the famed examine and all of his other spiritual exercises. There's uh, ample, ample um, material written about uh, Ignatius that you can find on the web uh, or in a library, and so we'll leave it at that. Um, Thomas is going to uh, talk to us specifically about what this, uh, what this method looks like, and then we're going to walk you through a version of it. So um, rather than continue, I'm going to let Thomas tell you about the active imagination method. Um, and we'll go from there. At the core of this method, it's about allowing our imaginations to actually take charge and allow us to step into a place where we can have a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus. And so despite all the other things that we're going to be talking about and despite the what will feel like a step-by-step -step procedure and the time frame and all those things at the core of all of that is your imagination allowing you to have that face-to-face -face conversation with Christ so keep that in mind as we go forward that's what all this is leading to um, and at no point are any of these things supposed to be limiting or imposed on you. They are, they are ways to allow you to get into a place where your imagination can be let out and, and be free. And so if any of these things don't work for you or don't feel right to you, throw them out the window. Um, one of those things that that is important for a lot of people and will help um, help create that space is to actually create a space. So 
chances are if you live in a household with other people, you're not going to want to try this in the middle of the kitchen while people are cooking. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's going to be helpful to find a place where you're comfortable, where it's quiet, where you can spend some time by yourself. Um, and like Damien said, in, with, within the restrictions that we are, are living in right now because of our current situation, that may be easier to find. Um, for others, it may be a bit more of a challenge. Um, so you figure out what works for you. Um, one of the things that I like to do is, this is, this is a practice that is near and dear to me. I do it often. Um, it's, I often find it helpful for me. And so as we go through this, I'm going to give you examples of what I do, just so you know how people do this. It is in no way to say this is how you should do it. The friar said it, it has nothing to do with that. Um, it's me as a person telling you as a person what works for me. Um, I prefer a room by myself. I will often sit at a desk but that's because I like to write during the process, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. For other people, sitting on a couch or sitting in their favorite chair is, is helpful. Make sure that you're comfortable. Um, I will often light a candle as that reminder that Christ is in this with me. Um, I also like candlelight. It just seems to soften things. Um, once you find that space that you feel comfortable, relax as much as you can. Um, take some deep breaths. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> Although, if that happens, you needed a nap, and that's fine. Um, but just get comfortable. Um, focus on where you are and what you're doing, and, and if you can for an hour not think about what's going on in the world, then take it as a gift. Um, as we go through this, and as you relax, and as you get into your space, be aware of how you're feeling. Um, are you anxious? Are you sad? Are you excited? Are you nervous? When we start to relax and let our, our, our guards down, things start to come up. And that's okay and good. And it, we don't have to fit, sit there and figure out why all of a sudden I feel this way. One of the things that I do is because I sit at a desk and I often have things to write with handy, which you may find helpful, in a, when a feeling arises, I just write it down. Um, we'll take a look at them later. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that they're there um, because that will also inform and be a part of our imagination as it goes forward. Um, as I said before, when we go through this, there are no right or wrong answers. This whole experience, this space, these feelings are all between you and the God that loves you. And so, just keep that in mind as we go. That you can't do this wrong. So as Damien said, we're going to go through this. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to read the story. Um, and, and what I encourage you to do as we begin to read, as you're in that comfortable place, is just shut your eyes and let your imagination go. Listen to the words, and as you, as you hear the story, ask yourself, what does the scenery look like? How's the landscape? What do you see? Are there birds? Are there rocks? Is there water? Are there people? What does it smell like? Through your imagination, engage all of your senses. When I do this, because I have that writing stuff available, I will just start jotting things down. The water's choppy. I smell a campfire next to me. And I just start setting the scene in my head of whatever comes to me. There's no right or wrong answers. And so I just start to write it down. And nothing fancy. Sometimes I just make a list just so I can keep it in mind at my fingertips. 
after we're finished with the story, we're actually going to ask you to pause your video and that way you can just spend time and look around at the scenery in your imagination. You're, it's just a time for you to familiarize with this new place that you find yourself in. And when you're ready, we're gonna, you can go ahead and resume your video and we'll come back to a second reading. And in that second reading, um, in your imagination, wherever it takes you, we're gonna ask you to, this time, start asking where are you in the story? Um, are you on the outskirts watching what's happening? Are you up on a hill? Are you standing right in the middle of it? Um, who do you identify with? Um, imagine yourself participating in the scene. What does it feel like? What do you do? What do you say? You're actually participating in what's going on. What I generally do when I come to this point is I actually just start writing a story. Um, nothing fancy. I'm not worrying about spelling or grammar or structure or any of those things. It's just me observing what I am doing in my imagination in this story. As we talk about this, I'm aware that it sounds complicated and a little scary if you've never done it before. You do these types of things in your imagination all the time. What is different, what may be different for some of you is actually slowing down to the point where you're noticing the steps that you're actually doing. If you don't want to write it all out, don't. Play it like a movie in your head. What would you say? Where are you? What does it feel like? What are you wearing? What does it mean to participate in, the, in this story? And afterward, we're going to ask you to pause your video again so you can just sit and, and think about what, what happened in your imagination, where, who you were, where you were. Um, at that point, just to give you some sense of feedback, when we do this, Damien and I are going to stop and talk about, we actually did this exercise with the same reading, and so we want to just share with you where we were. Um, and after that, we're actually going to get to the third reading, which, as I said before, is the actual point where this whole process is about your connection, your conversation, your interaction with Jesus. And so in this third reading, as we read, we're going to ask you, in your imagination, to focus on Jesus. Where is he in the story? Where is he standing? What's he doing? And we're going to ask that you imagine him turning his head and seeing you. Actually seeing you. What does he do in that moment? Does he walk over to you? Does he give you a hug? What does he say? What is it that Jesus wants to tell you in your imagination? And then how do you respond and have that dialogue? Remember when you do this that you aren't restricted to stay within the words and the things that happen within the story. This is not, as Damien said, this is not an analytical academic Bible study. The story is a place for your imagination to start. It's a jumping off point. So when I do this and I actually imagine the dialogue that I have with Jesus, I just start to write the story, and I often rewrite my own ending, and that's okay. Um, it's, it's about that interaction with Jesus. We are not in a play acting out the story of Lazarus. We're participating in it so that it becomes something new and different, and that God can actually speak through that experience to us. So it may look different. It will probably look different. And that's okay. You're not breaking the Bible. It's okay. <laughs> um, and just as before, we're going to ask you to stop the video after that and just have time with Jesus. What's that like? It, it may be five minutes. It may be half hour. And that's okay. 
whatever time you need. And then after we do this, we're going to talk about a response, um, which I think we'll get to later about what that actually looks like. But but there's it's always important in these imaginative or um, engaging contemplative experiences that you have some sort of response at the end, something that, that you sort of synthesize the experience with. And so we will we'll go through the practice first, and then we'll do the response. Don't worry, it's fun. It's not scary. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's, I was thinking as you were talking, Thomas, that um, it's probably important to note, too, that uh, when we practice Lexio, we almost always do that as a group activity. Um, you can do Lexio on your own, but it seems to work really well with a group. This one is a little different, that we, as we were trying to adapt this to a, as a group practice, <clears throat> we, we almost found it awkward in some ways. And so we're doing this uh, as a, a group uh, directed practice today to teach it. Um, but this is one that both of us have found uh, most useful as an individual contemplative practice rather than as something um, that we've done in a group. Although I will say that when we sat down to do this yesterday, it was because it was so unique and so different from what we normally do for contemplative study, I found it really useful. Um, and we're giving you rules and processes in order to teach it. Um, but those rules and processes, as Tom has already said, uh, are our guidelines and you should feel free to go where this takes you. Um, that, you know, you've already heard Thomas describe that he often sits and writes and I, um, when I do this exercise, I live entirely in my head. Uh, even as we were doing it yesterday, Thomas was writing and I was not. Um, and, and so those are, you know, those are not things of, this is not something you can do right or do wrong. This is an opportunity to encounter the story, um, to encounter what the story does in you, uh, and then to turn your mind and your spirit uh, to encountering who Jesus is and what your relationship with Jesus is through that experience of the story. So with that, we're going to begin the process. Uh, we're going to uh, read the text three times, and we'll walk you through, as Thomas said, with some pauses. Um, if you have the text um, at this point from the documents that we've attached, uh, you can read along. Um, with all of these contemplative studies, uh, I think there's a very great value in simply listening, as Thomas suggested, uh, possibly even closing your eyes. Uh, listen to the text read, and then you can go back and look at it afterwards. Um, but these stories and, and storytelling generally is meant to be heard, uh, and so we suggest that you do that. The text that we're using, if you don't have the documents, uh, comes from John chapter 11, um, the first 45 verses. That's a rather lengthy passage, and it is the gospel lesson for this coming Sunday. What we've done for the purposes of this exercise, simply to shorten the reading a bit, uh, and also uh, to keep it focused on one particular story, because the stories blend here a little bit, several different stories blend in. We've just taken out a few verses here and there. Um, we're not editing the Bible, don't worry. We still consider those part of the story. We're just not using them today. Um, and so we will be re reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Please use whatever version you like. Sometimes it's particularly helpful to hear this in an unfamiliar version because it gets you thinking about it in ways that you may not have done so before. So in a moment, we're going to uh, begin the readings. And as we read, uh, we're going to give you an alternate focus. We're simply going to, uh, to focus the uh, camera on a burning candle through the entirety of the reading. Um, we talked about using some imagery of the story and then decided that what we, we, wanted, we were asking you to make the imagery of the story, and so giving it to you in the form of an icon or art um, might short-circuit that for some people. So rather, we're giving you a neutral thing to focus on if you wish, um, but, it, but it may also be uh, better for you simply to close your eyes and listen. And as we go along, we'll give you directions for pausing uh, the video, taking that extra time, and then coming back when you're ready to move on to the next part.
Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. What does the scenery look like to you? As you stay with the story you heard, what does the landscape look like? What do you see around you? Are there birds? rocks? Is there water? What do you smell? What do you feel? I 
encourage you to pause your video and take as much time as you need to engage your imagination and engage your senses. And when you're ready, resume your video. As we listen to this gospel a second time, again, allow yourself to be drawn into the scene that you've created. This time, be aware if there are particular parts of the scene that draw you, a particular time in the story that draws you. Is there a particular character that you identify with? Feel, feel free to place yourself into that person or that role or that place. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, 
so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Place yourself again in that scene or in the part of the scene that most speaks to you. Where are you in this story? Are you on the outskirts watching? Do you identify with one of the characters? Who are you? Imagine yourself participating in the scene. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What can you touch? And as you place yourself in that role, ask yourself also, what am I feeling now? What does this raise in me? What are the emotions? What are my reactions to what is being said and done around me? And what do I do in response? What do I feel? What do I say? What do I do? Pause the video now and spend as much time as you need with this portion of the reading. When you're ready, resume the video and we'll move on to the third reading. Before we move on to the third, the final reading, we thought it might be helpful for you to hear some of our observations as we went through uh, this, uh, this exercise with this particular passage. Um, the, uh, the point of, of uh, sharing our thoughts with this, and if we were together, we would all have the opportunity to share things that came up for us. And It's actually one of the great values in, in doing uh, these kinds of exercises together is hearing what other people experience in the, in the story and in the passage. Uh, since we can't be there to do that live with you, uh, we wanted to share a few of our observations, not as the correct observations, uh, but rather just as what these, this story raised in each of us. Um, and um, wherever you're viewing this now, uh, if you want to take the opportunity to uh, share your observations or any thoughts on it, in, in the comments uh, or by sending them to us or however that you know, however you might want to express that uh, we we'd love to hear them and, and to share them with you and to um, be enriched by your understanding of the story so um, as we read through this what what uh, kinds of things were you seeing and experiencing what what was significant to you in the, in the uh, scene when I started with the first reading, it was, my imagination often goes to what's typical and as that starting point. And so I, I imagined a rocky scene that, that was on the flannel grass that I grew up with. Yes. Um, yeah. and and I could see Mary and Martha, and I could see the big stone in front of the tomb, and, and it was 
It was a very heavy scene, like understanding that there was people mourning in there. And, and I say people because I, I didn't see myself as part of that group. Right. Um, I, was, I was removed. Mm -hmm. um, and but what was interesting is the more that I spent time with it, I realized that the sky kept getting darker. Mm -hmm. And at first it was, it was almost like it was sunset, and then it just kept getting darker and darker. And, you know, I wrote that down and thought it was interesting. Still felt heavy, still felt all those things. Um, and, and through the second reading, I realized that I felt removed because I started to see myself in the tomb. Mm -hmm. And I identified with Lazarus, and I suddenly felt it felt cold and mm -hmm. things I felt like I couldn't move and I couldn't see and um, and that suddenly that rolling away the stone was terrifying mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden it was just in, entirely I was jolted out of whatever I was in mm -hmm. and so it was the whole process took me to a place that I had not started from. Yeah. It went from flannel graph to I'm a dead man. Yeah. And it went, it was a little drastic. Yeah, that, that wasn't part of my Sunday school experience. <laughs> no, so. not so much, no. no, no. 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 Yeah. I, I began with um, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm always grateful for when I'm reading the Gospels is having had the opportunity to be in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the landscapes and the, and the feel of it um, I have something physical to go with that. Um, but then I always also find myself pulling out of those limited memories of the Holy Land that I have and just you know, putting it somewhere more familiar. Um, and so the, the feel and the smell, I don't, you know, I don't remember what the fields around Jerusalem smelled like. I wasn't there long enough, but I remember the fields where I grew up. Um, and, and so uh, a lot of that... Um, but, I, but I, I do find it powerful, for example, um, when I hear the, the prompt in this story of what do you hear, um, I can clearly hear that, um, that wailing that goes with, with Middle Eastern mourning, the, the ululating and, and the wailing and the crying, that is um, an intentional display uh, of how, um, you know, we're, we're doing, and it's it's not even always people who are necessarily close to the departed. It's people who are saying that this is our job right now to express vocally the depth of emotion that, that right. people are feeling. Um, but the more I listened um, to the story and going through it, I realized that um, it was for me was mostly triggering. Uh, triggering is too strong a word because it's negative. But what it was accessing for me um, were memories surrounding uh, three significant deaths in my own family. Um, as you know, uh, I've uh, buried my mother, my father, and my oldest brother. Um, and th those were really profound and in some ways traumatic times. Um, and and I, I was listening to this story of Mary and Martha's experience of loss. Um, it, it immediately brought that up for me, particularly because Jesus arrived four days after Lazarus died, and I could picture um, the, the scene in, in our home, the house where I grew up, um, a few days after any one of those three big deaths. And, and I picture all the stuff that people have brought to eat, and, and um, I picture uh, all of the you know, all of the, the busyness, it's kind of gotten to a point of being busy and people trying to accomplish things and doing various. Mm -hmm. But I also was very aware, particularly on the second reading when we tried to focus on feelings, I was very aware of what that felt like. Um, and it was definitely a period of, of that period of numbness, mm -hmm. of just not, none of this seems real. That became really significant for me then when um, the uh, when the actual raising of Lazarus happened, because uh, suddenly in the middle of all this bustle, 
and, and just trying to get on with things and not feeling anything, Jesus shows up. And I, and I found myself, uh, in a way, being angry at him. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying, now you show up? Really? <laughs> it's a bit late. Yeah. And then he wants to go see the tomb. And so we go see the tomb. And we, you know, we have been in the midst of all this. Uh, I know I didn't go back to visit any of my family's graves four days later. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for that. Um, and so here they go. And suddenly Jesus is talking about raising him. And I could only, a lot of the gospel stories, because of the way that they're summarized and packaged, um, we, we, see, uh, we see a problem, we see a conflict, and then we see this beautiful, joyous resolution. And I was aware going through this that the, the neat, tidy ending isn't really there. Um, Lazarus is raised. But I was imagining myself in the midst of that and the numbness. I don't know that I could say that that would have solved anything for me. All of a sudden, nothing else. There's, here's one more huge thing that just doesn't make sense. Which part of this is real? Is this still me being numb and thinking? Because I know that when my mom or my dad or my brother was gone, there's this piece of you that just wants to say, well, we'll just wake up tomorrow and everything will be fine. It'll be back how it was. And then to suddenly actually have that, um, I, I don't know that that's unmitigated joy. I think it's, it's, it would have to be this reaction of, is, is any of this really real? Uh, and so I, I was surprised to find um, that this happy story, as we've been taught it, um, for me was, was not all of a sudden a magical resolution. It was still very, very complex. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to the third reading in a moment, but um, we... Uh, as we go into the third reading, um, talk, would you talk a little bit again about the idea of what we're trying to do in the third reading and, and what, what, we're, what, the, what is the next step that we're taking with this? So this, with all contemplative exercises, the, the whole purpose is to have that that moment of connection or communion or dialogue with Jesus. And so what we've been doing up until this point with, with the places you've gone in your imagination and the things that you've seen and smelled and experienced, we're leading you deeper into a space where you and Jesus can connect. And so as we move into this third reading, it's all about Jesus. It's the, the scene, the scene has been set, the stage and characters are ready. And now is that moment where you and Jesus connect. And, and to focus on, on what he says and, and how you respond and are you angry or is it jarring or is it, do you just fall into each other's arms? Whatever that honest, authentic reaction is. Because as we've said multiple times, there, there is no right or wrong answer. And so you don't have to worry that you have to give the Sunday school answer because you're in a safe, quiet place that you chose to be safe and comfortable in. Um, there's no rulers to be wrapped across your knuckles. You're fine. Um, so you can have that authentic experience. That's what this is for. So let's progress to the third reading. I invite you to take a few deep breaths. To relax. Go back to that scene to remember what you saw and what you felt. Do 
to remember the scenery and where you were standing. I invite you to be back in that place in your imagination. And as we read, I invite you to find Jesus. Find him in the scene, and to imagine him turning and seeing you. Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth 
and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Where is Jesus for you in this story? As you imagine him turning his head and seeing you, what does he do? Does he walk over to you? Does he smile and hug you? What does he say? What is it that Jesus wants to tell you in this story? What does it feel like to hear those words? And how do you respond? I invite you to pause your video and spend some time with Jesus. And whenever you're ready, resume the video and we'll proceed. So we hope that you've had a significant encounter uh, with Jesus in this story. Uh, we, uh, as we shared before the final reading, <clears throat> we know that uh, sometimes the encounters that we have here, the things that we observe here are unexpected. Uh, sometimes they're entirely different than what we thought the message of this passage was and, and may well be very different from what it would have been that we'd gotten to with um, an investigative study of the passage. But that's the point of, uh, of this contemplative reading is to allow um, the spirit to speak through the passage, to allow um, our internal world to speak into the external world and ultimately, as we said, to encounter Jesus. We're not going to share our observations about that third round this time, solely because we don't want to give a, a, an example of correct answers, because there aren't any. Um, uh, and particularly because uh, what we want to leave you with um, is a suggestion of an opportunity in a way um, now to, to put this into uh, to put it into practice, uh, a way to further process the experience you've had, uh, and and to uh, uh, and to allow that creative process of interacting with the story in, in imagination and actively imagining ourselves in this story um, to take that creative process one step further. And so I'm going to let Thomas talk about creative expression as a, as a way of going forward with this. Anytime you do, anytime we do, um, this imaginative process, it's very helpful to find a way to make it external. Um, and one of, the, one of the easiest ways to do that um, is some sort of creative expression. And that can be as simple or ornate or, or as you want it to be. Um, as we've said over and over again, there are no right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. So if you felt that this whole time the emotions that have come up for you are just a jumble. There's so many different layers of emotions that that experience that you had with Christ had so many different things in it that all you want to do 
is do layers of color on paper, like crayons on paper. That's fine. If you feel the need to go out and paint an entire fresco on your front wall, <laughs> get permission and go for it. Yeah. Um, it's whatever, it's whatever will connect you to that experience that you had with Christ. That's the important part. And, and Thomas, I can hear some people at this point saying, oh, no, I'm done, I'm not an artist. Right. This is the point at which I'm done. And that, that we really would want to encourage people not to do that totally. because not being an artist doesn't cut off your options. No. Um, so I, I may be interrupting where you are already going, but I'm no, going to talk about what kind of options, for, particularly for people who because um, if, if someone's an artist sitting watching this, they're already going, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm right. going to do a Dutch pour acrylic. And right. like, but if you're not an artist, right. um, uh, what, what are kinds of ways that they might do this? So, as I said when, I, when we started speaking about this, the important part is to externalize it. So, if that means something as simple as when writing out, when I was with Jesus, I felt this. Or if something that came to mind in your imagination was this certain color rock that you kept seeing, go find that rock and stick it in a prominent place where you'll see it. Mm -hmm. If it's, if you're, you feel more comfortable writing, write a poem about it. Mm -hmm. What the point is to make that externalized expression of that moment with Christ. That's what this, that's what all these steps were for, were to come to that one moment. And it's something so that when you see that rock two days from now, you'll remember back to the story mm -hmm. and your participation in the story. And you may well surprise yourself. Totally. Yeah. It's um, worth noting too, that uh, as we said before, you're welcome to share comments uh, on the video. And if you want to uh, to share the work that you've done, you're welcome to do that. We'd love to see them. Yeah. I know Father Jesse has said, uh, for those of you at Seacliff, that, that he would be happy to receive any of these works that you've done and, and to share them with the, with the parish there as well. Um, but also, that's not what this is for. Um, this is for you. And if nobody else in the world ever sees it, if you want to do stick figures um, and, you know, then you know, nobody else ever sees it. And, and as we talked about this in preparing for this, I, I took one down from my wall that I had done in a previous uh, uh, interaction with, with a different story. Um, and I showed it to Thomas and I said, okay, what gospel story is this? And he had no idea uh, because it, did, it wasn't his interaction with the story. Um, and so it, it doesn't, it's not this, you're not necessarily, you know, if you've got the ability to do that fresco, I'm jealous of you. Right. Um, but the, the, you're not necessarily producing something here that is a literal representation of the story or that others will look at and go, oh, that's amazing, I'm touched. Um, this is for you. And, and if you want to share it with others, terrific. And if you don't, that's not relevant. One of the things that I remind myself in doing work like this is that it doesn't matter what we create. God is still going to put it on his refrigerator. Yeah. I so like yeah. there there is no right and wrong, there is no scale of better or worse. There's no such thing as good or bad expression when dealing with this. So it's whatever that authentic expression is that you create. Right. Because it is about you and the God who loves you. We hope this has been a helpful tool, and we hope you'll experiment with it with other um, with other passages, and that you'll you'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, to make use of this as one of many tools uh, in in your spiritual life and your spiritual growth. Um, and, and please do take the time to uh, to go back and and uh, uh, work on that creative expression to to make something out of it, uh, as well as uh, to. Uh, keep it in your awareness as you move into uh, your days that probably look very different than your normal days right now um, and how all of this encounter with Jesus is speaking to who you are and where you are right now. Um, we also encourage you to uh, share this with anyone else that you think that it will be useful uh, 
before. Um, you're welcome to share links to the video. You're welcome to share the documents that you uh, download or, or print off or whatever. Um, we're, we're happy to have this uh, shared. And we, we'd love to claim that this is our brilliant idea about how to study the scriptures, but it's been around for hundreds of years. Um, we kind of do a lot of things that have been around for hundreds of years in, in monastic life. Um, but uh, again, uh, we're glad that you could be with us, uh, not physically, uh, but we want all of you to know, whoever is watching, uh, that we continue to keep all of you, um, those of you who we know and, and care for personally, and those of you who we don't know and care for because uh, all of us are, are together in this, all of us are God's beloved children, and all of us uh, are invested uh, and connected one in the life of another. And so uh, we close simply with uh, the blessing that we uh, as a community have often used at the end of any of our contemplative Bible studies together, and may it be uh, a blessing uh, for you as well at this time. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Oh my gosh. Oh, now you get to be part of it. Oh, I can't believe we shut you out. I can't believe we shut you out, but now you get to be part of things. Why were you not allowed to be here? Oh my goodness. You're a good girl. You two are. Yes, you are. <laughs>